Lesson 12 for September 15 to 21, ready for teaching on September 22. Confinement in Caesarea, Sabbath afternoon, September 15. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we open our hearts to you today as we open your word, and we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us as we study more about the life of Paul and of the Church in the book of Acts. We pray that as we do so, we will see Jesus, we will see your love for us, and that we may take comfort that you are there. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Acts chapter 26 and verse 29. Whether quickly or not, I pray to God that not only you, but also all who are listening to me today, might become such as I am, except for these chains. Let's read that again, Acts 26 verse 29. Whether quickly or not, I pray to God that not only you, but also all who are listening to me today, might become such as I am, except for these chains. Paul's transfer to Caesarea began a two-year imprisonment in the city. Acts 24.27 reads, When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favour to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. More precisely, he was in Herod's praetorium. Acts 23 verse 35 reads, He said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. And this was the official residence of the Roman governor. During those years, he had several hearings in which he would appear before two Roman governors, Felix and Festus, and a king, Agrippa too thus further fulfilling the ministry that God gave him in Acts 9.15. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. In all the hearings, Paul always claimed innocence, alleging that no evidence could be produced against him, as the absence of witnesses demonstrated. In fact, the whole narrative is intended to show that Paul had done nothing worthy of arrest, and that he could be released had he not appealed to Caesar. These hearings, though, did offer him opportunities to witness about Jesus and the great hope found in the promise of the resurrection. Yet, there were still years of deep anxiety as well as of tedious confinement in which the Apostle seems to have had no support of any kind from the church in Jerusalem, whose leaders, as Ellen White writes in Acts of the Apostles, page 403, still cherished a feeling that Paul should be held largely responsible for the existing prejudice. Sunday, September 16, before Felix. Five days after Paul's transfer to Caesarea, a group of important Jewish leaders, the high priests, some members of the Sanhedrin, and a professional lawyer named Tertullus, came down from Jerusalem and formally laid before Felix their case against the apostle. We read that in Acts 24, verses 1 through to 9. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus, and they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect, and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. The other Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. This is the only trial in Acts in which the accusers employed a lawyer. 
In his speech, Turtledus tried an interesting strategy to win the governor's favour. It was simply not true that under Felix the Jews had enjoyed a long period of peace. In fact, no other governor had been so repressive and violent, and this repression generated an enormous antagonism among the Jews toward Roman rule. With a lot of ingenuity, Tertullus used the governor's own administrative policy to convince him that he would achieve political stability in this case, also only by means of severe repression. Then he went on to press three specific charges against Paul. One, that Paul was an agitator who constantly was fermenting unrest among Jews throughout the empire, verse 5. Two, that he was a ringleader of the Nazarenes, verse 5, which implicated Christianity as a whole as a kind of disruptive movement. And three, that he had attempted to defile the Jerusalem temple, verse 6. Question. Read Acts 24, verses 10 through to 19. How did Paul answer each one of these charges? Acts 24, beginning at verse 10. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defence. You can easily verify that no more than twelve days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple, or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues, or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges that they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that is in accordance with the law, and that is written in the prophets, and I have the same hope in God as these men themselves have that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But... There were some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Two further points raised by Paul were devastating to the accuser's case. One, the absence of the Asian witnesses in verses 18 and 19, which had the potential of rendering the trial invalid. And two, the fact that the Jews there could speak only about Paul's hearing before the Sanhedrin the week before. And that's recorded in verse 20. Or, these who are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. And as such, they had nothing to accuse him of except that he believed in the resurrection of the dead. Actually, in Acts 23, 6, it says, Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. Felix immediately understood the weight of Paul's arguments, also because he was somewhat acquainted with Christianity, probably through his Jewish wife, Drusilla. The fact is, he decided to adjourn the proceedings until further notice. Felix's response in verses 24 to 27 revealed much about his character. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias the commander comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, "'That's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you.' At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, but because Felix wanted to grant a favour to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. And so he procrastinated, he was able to be bribed, and he was opportunistic. 
Paul had little chance of a fair hearing with someone like Felix. And to finish today, read Acts twenty four sixteen. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Paul said that he strove always to have a conscience void of offence toward God and toward men. What does that mean? What, if anything, would you have to change in order to say the same thing? Monday, September 17, before Festus. After two years holding Paul in prison just to win the favour of the Jews, Felix was replaced by Portius Festus as the governor of Judea, and we read about that in Acts 24:27. when two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, but because Felix wanted to grant a favour to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Festus ruled from AD 60 to AD 62. Question. Read Acts 25, verses 1 through to 5. How does this help reveal the hatred that preaching the truth can cause in those who don't want to believe? Acts 25, verses 1 through to 5. Three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and the Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. They requested Festus as a favour to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Festus answered, Paul is being held at Caesarea, and I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me, and if the man has done anything wrong, they can press charges against him there. After spending eight or ten days with them, Festus went down to Caesarea. The next day he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought before him. Probably because they already had failed once in their attempt to convince Felix of the charges against Paul, the leaders did not want to take any chances again. In what appears to have been Festus's first visit to Jerusalem, they requested, as a favour to them, a change of jurisdiction, asking him to hand Paul back to them so he could be tried by the Sanhedrin in accordance with Jewish law. Yet the request was only a camouflage to conceal their real intent, to kill Paul. Although Festus was willing to reopen the case, he said that the hearing would take place in Caesarea, not in Jerusalem, which means that Paul would be tried by Roman law. As soon as Festus was back in Caesarea, he convened the tribunal, and Paul's opponents started laying out the charges against Paul, as we read in verse 7. When Paul came in, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him. They brought many serious charges against him, but they could not prove them. This time, Luke does not repeat the charges, but based on Paul's answer in verse 8, we can see that they were similar to the ones brought two years before, perhaps with the further emphasis that, for being an agitator, Paul also represented a threat to the empire. Question. Read Acts chapter 25, verses 9 through to 12. When sensing that Festus could use him for political reasons, how did Paul react? Acts 25, beginning at verse 9. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favour, said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Paul answered, I am now willing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have not done any wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, You have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. In the end, Festus turned out not much different from Felix with regard to his political strategies. Acts 24.27 again, when two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, but because Felix wanted to grant a favour to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. 
unwilling to lose the Jews, support so early in his administration by declaring Paul innocent, he thought of granting them their original request, to have the apostle tried by the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. This, however, was not acceptable to Paul, who knew he could not expect to be treated fairly there, left to the whim of his enemies. So, capitalising on his Roman rights, he insisted that he was entitled to be tried by a Roman tribunal, and envisaged no other way out of that precarious situation. He resolved to appeal to the highest instance of Roman justice, which was the Emperor himself. Tuesday, September 18, before Agrippa. Festus agreed to grant Paul's request to be sent to Rome. We read that in verse 12 of chapter 25. After Festus had conferred with his council, he declared, You have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. Meanwhile, the governor took advantage of a state visit by Herod Agrippa II to consult him concerning Paul's case in particular regarding what kind of information he should send to the emperor in his official report. Festus was not yet acquainted enough with Jewish affairs, and Agrippa could certainly help him. Acts 26 verses 2 and 3 reads, King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defence against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you were well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Question. Read Acts 25 verses 13 to 22. And that reads, a few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. He said, There is a man here whom Felix left as a prisoner. When I went to Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him and asked that he be condemned. The question is, what did Festus tell Agrippa about Paul, and how did the king respond? I told them that it is not the Roman custom to hand over anyone before they have faced their accusers and have had an opportunity to defend themselves against the charges. When they came here with me, I did not delay the case, but convened the court the next day and ordered the man to be brought in. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I had expected. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus, who Paul claimed was alive. I was at a loss how to investigate such matters, so I asked if he would be willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial there on these charges. But when Paul made his appeal to be held over for the emperor's decision, I ordered him held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. He replied, Tomorrow you will hear him. Agrippa II the last of the Herodians came to Caesarea with his sister Bernice to salute the new governor. In his description of Paul's case, Festus revealed his surprise that the charges against him were not related to any capital offence, whether political or criminal. Instead, they had to do with matters concerning Jewish religion, in particular a certain Jesus, who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive, Acts 25.19. Paul had already stated before the Sanhedrin that he was on trial because of his belief in Jesus' resurrection, and now Festus made it clear that this was indeed the real point at issue. Question. Read Acts 25, verses 23 to 27. How does Luke describe the ceremony in which Paul appeared before Agrippa? Verse 23 of chapter 25. The next day Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking military officers and the prominent men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. 
Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man, the whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. I found he had done nothing deserving of death, but because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. But I have nothing definite to write to his majesty about him. Therefore, I have brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation, I may have something to write. For I think it is unreasonable to send a prisoner on to Rome without specifying the charges against him. Ellen White writes in the Acts of the Apostles, page 434, And now Paul, still manacled, stood before the assembled company. What a contrast was here presented. Agrippa and Bernice possessed power and position, and because of this they were favoured by the world. But they were destitute of the traits of character that God esteems. They were transgressors of his law, corrupt in heart and life. Their course of action was abhorred by heaven. And so to finish the day. What should this story teach us about how outward appearances, which may be pleasing to human sight, can often be deceptive about the reality behind the appearance? What about ourselves, too? How different is the appearance from the reality? Wednesday, September 19, Paul's Defence With the scene set and the royal guests seated alongside the governor, the prisoner was brought in to present his defence, which was aimed primarily at Agrippa, as Festus had already heard it before. Acts 25, 8-11 is where he heard it before. Let's read that. Then Paul made his defence. I have done nothing wrong against the Jewish law or against the temple of, or against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favour, said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court, where I ought to be tried. I have not done any wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. Question. Read Acts 26, verses 1 to 23. What was Paul doing in his speech before Agrippa? Acts 26, beginning at verse 1. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defence. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defence against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jewish people all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that I conform to the strictest sect of our religion, living as a Pharisee. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. This is the promise our twelve tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison, and, when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. On one of these journeys I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. 
We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I said, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and, as the first to rise from the dead, would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. Paul's speech was in fact an autobiographical report of his life both before and after his conversion. In terms of content, it recalls the one in Acts 22, verses 1 to 24, which he spoke before the crowd in Jerusalem. The apostle began to try to secure Agrippa's favour. He acknowledged his gratitude for the opportunity to state his case before such an eminent person, all the more so because Agrippa was well acquainted with all the customs and issues related to Jewish religion. For that reason, Agrippa could be of great assistance in helping the Roman governor understand that the charges brought against him had no merit and were false. The speech can be divided into three parts. In part 1, verses 4 to 11, Paul describes his former Pharisaic piety, which was widely known among his contemporaries in Jerusalem. As a Pharisee, he believed in the resurrection of the dead, which was essential to the fulfilment of Israel's ancestral hope. The Jews, therefore, were being inconsistent in opposing his teaching, for there was nothing in it that was not fundamentally Jewish. But he understood their attitude quite well, and that was because he himself had once found it so incredible that God could have raised Jesus that even he persecuted those who believed that way. In part 2, verses 12 to 18, Paul reported how his perspective had changed since his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, and the call that he received to take the gospel message to the Gentiles. Paul says finally that the impact of what he had seen, verses 19 to 23, was such that he had no choice but to obey and to carry out his missionary activity, the only reason that he was now on trial. The real issue behind his arrest, therefore, was not that he had violated the Jewish law or desecrated the temple. Rather, it was because of his message of Jesus' death and resurrection, which was in full harmony with the Scriptures and allowed believing Gentiles to have an equal share in salvation. And so to finish today, read Acts 26.18. According to that text, what happens to those who have salvation in Christ... How have you experienced this reality? Acts 26 verse 18 To open their eyes, in order to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Thursday, September 20, Paul before the leaders. Although Paul was speaking to Agrippa, Festus was the first to react, as seen in Acts 26, 24. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defence. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. 
Festus would have had no problem if Paul had spoken about the immortality of the soul, but even the ancient Greco-Roman knew that both concepts, immortality and resurrection, do not go along well with one another. Thus they kept the former and rejected the latter. This is why Paul says elsewhere that the gospel was foolish to the Gentiles. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 23, But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and foolishness to Gentiles. In a respectful manner, Paul defended the sanity of his ideas and turned to Agrippa, a Jew who could not only understand him, but also who could confirm that what he was saying was in agreement with the Hebrew prophets. As we read in Acts twenty six, twenty five, and 26, I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice, because it was not done in a corner. Question. Read Acts 26, verses 27 to 28. What was Agrippa's response to Paul's pressing question? Acts 26, verse 27. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul's answer put Agrippa in a difficult position. As a Jew, he would never deny his belief in the Scriptures. On the other hand, if he gave an affirmative answer, there would be no option but for him to accept Jesus as the Messiah. His reply was a clever escape from the logical trap he was in. Are you so quickly persuading me to become a Christian? This is a better translation of the Greek than the traditional you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Paul's rejoinder reveals an impressive level of commitment to the gospel. Whether quickly or not, I pray to God that not only you, but also all who are listening to me today, might become such as I am, except for these chains. That was Acts 26 verse 29. In these last words in that hearing, the apostle did not plead to be free, as were those listening to him. Instead, he wished they could be like him, except for the chains that bound him. Paul's missionary zeal greatly surpassed his care for his own safety. Question. Read Acts chapter 26, verses 30 to 32. How did Agrippa express his conviction of Paul's innocence? The king arose, and with him the governor and Bernice, and those sitting with them, after they left the room, they began saying to one another, This man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Festus needed Agrippa's help only to fill in the report. We read about that in Acts 25. Paul's appeal to Caesar had already been formally granted. We also read that in Acts 25. The prisoner was no longer under the governor's jurisdiction. And so to finish today, read Acts 26, verses 24 to 28. What did Paul ultimately appeal to? And what should this tell us about what our final authority in matters of faith should always be? At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defence. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice, because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Friday, September 21. From the Seventh Day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1066 and 1067, Ellen White comments read, 
Did the mind of Agrippa at these words revert to the past history of his family and their fruitless efforts against him whom Paul was preaching? Did he think of his great-grandfather Herod and the massacre of the innocent children of Bethlehem, of his great-uncle Antipas and the murder of John the Baptist, of his own father Agrippa I and the martyrdom of the Apostle James? Did he see in the disasters which speedily befell these kings an evidence of the displeasure of God in consequence of their crimes against his servants? Did the pomp and display of that day remind Agrippa of the time when his own father, a monarch more powerful than he, stood in that same city, attired in glittering robes, while the people shouted that he was a god? Had he forgotten how, even before the admiring shouts had died away, vengeance swift and terrible had befallen the vainglorious king? Something of all this flitted across Agrippa's memory, but his vanity was flattered by the brilliant scene before him, and pride and self-importance banished all nobler thoughts. End of quote. And that brings us to our three to four discussion questions this week. 1. In class, discuss Paul's decision to appeal to Caesar. Was this decision correct? Well, let's compare that with Acts 25.25. 25. I found he had done nothing deserving of death, but because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. And chapter 26, verses 31 and 32. After they left the room, they began saying to one another, This man is not doing anything that deserves death or punishment. Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. To what extent can we legitimately make strategic decisions to protect ourselves instead of relying entirely on God's care? 2. Reflect on Paul's statement to Agrippa. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. What does it tell us about Paul? How faithful are we to our missionary calling as Christians. First Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Question 3. Paul had a passion for people not for numbers, but for people. In his final hearing in Caesarea, he said to his audience that his heart's desire was that all of them would be like him, that is, saved by God's grace. As we read in Acts 26.29, Paul replied, Short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. He did not wish his own freedom or justice more than he wished them to experience God's salvation. What can we learn from his example here? How much are we willing to sacrifice in order to see the gospel spread? And four, Agrippa had a chance to hear the gospel right from the mouth of Paul, and yet he rejected it. How can we be careful not to miss great opportunities when they appear right before us? That is, how can we stay spiritually attuned to the realities around us? And one of the realities for me right now is that tonight is the beginning of Big Camp in South Queensland. It's a convention for the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the South Queensland Conference. And tomorrow morning there'll be over 8,000 people on the campground. During the week, uh, up to 3,500 people are camped full-time. We'll go right through till... Uh, next weekend. We'll have two Sabbaths, two Friday nights, and the week in between. And I have the privilege of running the radio station for the camp. And this radio station broadcasts to the surrounding community. It broadcasts to people out there and in the camp uh, the meetings from the big tent, uh, which seats about 3,000 itself. And uh, we'll broadcast those. We'll interview people uh, who are visiting. We'll interview people who have special projects or ministries and we'll play some excellent music at the same time. And uh, that's on 90.7 if you happen to be in the area. But if you can't be in the area, then look for the streaming of the main meetings from the Big Tent, uh, which will occur throughout the day and the evening as well. 
remember it'll be in Eastern Australian time, Eastern Standard Time it's called here, um, and uh, you can watch. And you can watch on the Adventist television service, which will be beaming it direct, live streaming it. And the address that you need, if you want to listen to that, is online at www.livingministrymedia.com.au. That's L-I-V-I-N-G-M-I-N-I-S-T-R-Y-M-E-D-I-A dot com dot A-U. And you'll be able to find the uh, list of uh, times when the programs will be available. And uh, afterwards, you can actually download them on YouTube as well. Well, it's now time to say goodbye and I'm going to enjoy camp for the next 10 days. Your reader for this week's Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide has been Dr. Percy Harold. It has been produced in the studios of Christian Services for the Blind, distributed under the auspices of the Sabbath School Department by HopeChannel.com. Inside Story Our mission story this week is once again by Andrew McChesney from Adventist Mission. Kiong Kwon, a business owner in South Korea, decided that he and other church members needed to go house to house to share the gospel and fill a church that he had planted. House to house work is difficult, Kwon said. Most people are not home during the day. Those who are usually don't want to talk. But I obeyed Ellen White's advice. That advice is found in Ellen White's book, Christian Service, page 113, and reads, Of equal importance with special public efforts is house-to-house work in the homes of the people. In large cities, there are certain classes that cannot be reached by public meetings. These must be searched out as the shepherd searches for his lost sheep. So, every Thursday, Quan and other church members went from house to house. They didn't carry religious literature or, or offer Bible studies. Instead, they asked, How can we help you and your family? One day, Quan pressed many doorbells without any response. But the front door swung open at one house, and a woman said, Come in. Quan entered the house, but expressed shock at the instant invitation. Do you know who I am? he said. Why did you let me in? I know that you are evangelizing, she said. But most people reject me, he persisted. Why are you welcoming me in? The woman explained that she had dreamed that night that a tall stranger would visit. In the dream, the tall man had opened her front door and told her, Come out, hurry. When you pressed the doorbell, she said, I saw you on the intercom TV screen and you looked tall, so I let you in. Quan, growing more surprised by the minute, asked whether he could be of help. My daughter is depressed, the woman said. Please help her. Bring your daughter to the living room, Quan said. No, my daughter refuses to come out of her room. It will be different this time, Quan said. Just tell her to come out. Surprisingly, the daughter came to the living room and Quan prayed and read the Bible with her. He returned the next Thursday and read the Bible with her again. The daughter started attending church and was baptised. This has been my experience repeatedly, Quan says. It is God who does the mission. Your reader for this week's Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide has been Dr. Percy Harold. It has been produced in the studios of Christian Services for the Blind, distributed under the auspices of the Sabbath School Department by HopeChannel.com.